go right uh, here. <clears throat> I want to know how to go back to the. Now we got to share share screen. Okay. All right. All right. Share screen. Share desktop. Oh. And we're golden. All right. Here we go again. <laughs> got producer Will. Here and uh, stepping in for Coach Bergman. Coach Bergman is an uh, undisclosed location. <laughs> but um, and we're glad a bunch of you guys made it again today. Will, you're going to be uh, monitoring the chat, right? Absolutely. Right. So, any questions or any uh, comments or um, insights, feel free to just throw it in the, <clears throat> excuse me, throw it in the chat. And uh, and we'll answer uh, as we go or, or toward the end. Um, my, my, my thoughts around today was, was, was kind of continuing the conversation around defending two-man, also adding some insight from an offensive perspective and uh, doing a different game from the, from the PLL. Uh, I was following uh, one of the PLL highlight uh, Twitter handles, and they had cranked out four or five different two-man plays that they were really quick, and I thought those were pretty good examples to us to talk about from a defensive standpoint, but also uh, get some offensive uh, perspective as well. And, you know, the, the PLL, you know, clearly had some very specific rules about who they were sliding to and who they were not sliding to, how they hedged, how they switched, you know, which, which is different than uh, how I think about uh, defense, but still be, be insightful because there, there's not a team in the country that's not doing some combination of pairs and, and two-man stuff. So hopefully uh, you find this insightful. So we'll go to the first uh, clip here. And, you know, you can see this kind of, you know, I call this dodge a left-to-left uh, -a -left jab. So he keeps the stick in his left hand and – if you don't square up the right way here, you can really, really make it easy for a guy to get to the middle of the field. So that, you know, that left to left jab is really hard to defend if you, if you square up with a guy, because the guy's going to get here. Even if you catch that shoulder, even if you drive that guy on that shoulder. And, and, you know, how teams are playing this in the PLL varies. You know, you can, you can slide from this guy and have him evaluate this for, you know, 180 degrees if you wanted to. So you, you could potentially go from this guy, you know. You can obviously go adjacent from this guy. That's obviously an option. And then you have some, you know, you have a player over here who could end up. So you have three different people who can be, who can become your, your slide guy. So we talked about this dodge. You know, I think defensively, you want to be a little bit more upfield with your right foot. So on ball, you want this right foot to just be a little bit higher than his foot. And what, what that'll mean is you're going to have a lot more surface area to hit on this defender. And you'll probably, if you get good contact, you'll have him at that angle. If you don't get any contact, he's running into the middle of the field. So that's why his right foot becomes so important. So I'm going to play this out, right? You're here. You can see this two-man happening. And, and one of kind of my tenets about coaching two man and the teams I coach know this is this guy comes out here. You're not sure if that's going to be a pick and a, and a pop behind the ball, right? Is it going to be a, you know, a true pick and this guy, you know, sets it, you know, at this angle, right? You're not sure what it's going to be. So when you're this defender, and this is a simple thing you can tell your, players is I want the circle defenseman to outwork the picking offensive player. Because if you outwork them, it gives you a chance to outthink them. And if you can outwork them and outthink them, you're going to make a switch and get through decision here that doesn't have to be 100% right, but it definitely raises the percentage of you being right. So the circle guy has to work harder than, than this pick man. Right? So they get here, and it becomes a pick and slip. So everybody, everybody see that? That's a, you know, he comes out here. He went through all that, right? That's a pick and slip. So he's popped behind. This is a really critical 
thing from, from a defensive standpoint. I'm, I personally am not a huge fan of aggressive hedging or fake slides because these guys, even at the, at, at the high school level, the offensive players are so talented. And if you get caught in this scenario, that guy is further upfield than this, than X. So X is the guy who picked and slipped. Is that now the fact that he's, his foot is pointed here, he's perpendicular to the GLE, which is a, which is a thing for me. The fact that he's like that, his whole body is facing that. That means if this becomes a pass, he's going to be chasing that pass. If that pass happens, he's probably going to be chasing downhill. And I don't, I don't particularly like that. But I know every, every team do, does a little different. So he shows aggressively here, which makes you vulnerable to that pass. This white team is staying with this cut. So this guy's clearly out of the conversation here as far as being able to, to do anything. He's completely face guarding his man. And so if you don't go from this guy, if you don't make that play, then here becomes your next potential candidate. Call him Y. All right, so that guy's gone. You got this pick and slip that's happening here. And, and coming back to this orientation by this defender, the one where my cursor is on, I'm gonna circle him. The other reason I don't like him being perpendicular to this Dodger is that he, the commitment by him is upfield, which is gonna make that chase back. And he's gonna get so heavy over his right foot that it's gonna make it hard for him to chase back. And for the next two seconds, you know, uh, if he does chase back, he's gonna be further away from him. And when you're this committed, in my, in my feelings, is, and with no ball pressure, you have two people committed to the ball, and that's, that's going to be really good for the um, defenseman. Um, so here we go. So the, this guy doesn't go, and he chases back. And you can see, as he's chasing back, this guy right here, the only thing he can really do right now is to have custody of him, mostly because of that footwork that he showed two seconds earlier. This guy, we've made it clear that he's dancing with this guy here. He can't do anything. So now, unbeknownst, is they basically created a two on two. This guy, call him one and two, call this A and B, you know. And, and you know it's a, it's a two on two because everyone else is he's locked on he's looking away, this guy's trying to help, and this guy's below GLE, which always strikes me as a strange thing, is that this ball is at let's call it thirteen yards. The ball is at thirteen. Why would you be below GLE? But I think that's a consistent theme in some of these clips. So you're basically creating, you know, a four on four up here. So. It's a, it's a and B versus one and two right now. And we'll see we'll see how it plays out for them, Cotton. And so he now gets to the middle of the field, and this is what a what a goal is going to look like here in a split second. You have you have these two guys, and again, I'm not indicting the way the white team's playing defense, just the way that's the way that they've been taught or whatever their strategy was going into the game is that two people below go on extended who can't really do anything, two offensive guys. To me, the way this should look like a four on six instead of a two on two. These guys over here are dancing with their guys. You know, the ball's over here. So, so now, one, the slightest mistake means it's a goal. And if you're an, if you're an adjacent sliding team, which – which I, I assume this is what they wanted to create, is as this plays out, you would need communication from, you know, kind of basically opposite the way that the ball is spinning. So let me show you what that could look like, that, that he would be talking to one of these low defensemen and he would talk to him and he would rotate up. 
kind of opposite of the way that the ball is moving. But that doesn't happen because these two guys stayed with their men below GLE. And next thing you know, you got a guy fading to five and five. You can see these two guys know what they're saying. Uh Uh-oh. They're looking at this pass and they didn't have the communication required, you know, maybe him talking to him and him talking to one of these low guys and him talking to him and him rotating up the hash. That didn't happen. And so as a result, now you get this rip. And and so I, it's the price of, listen, I, Jason slide, Cree slide, however you do it, the only way you survive it is when you're the furthest away defenders, that you are realize that you're the furthest away. So let's let's look at that sequence again, right? This guy now becomes super critical to them being able to rotate adjacently. But the fact that he, remember, and I pointed this out, is that his footwork on that hedge was like at that angle. And because it was at that angle, he is now chasing back to his guy. And the only thing that he can really have awareness of is this guy. And now you can see the dominoes begin to fall. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. He didn't rotate and push. And now, you know, uh, whatever he's doing is not great because he's running somewhere and the ball is being ripped past his goalie's face. We have our first question. First, we have the first question. First question from none other than Steve Moreland. He wants to know what orientation, excuse me, you would like the pick defenseman, if not perpendicular to the end line. You know, again, this is just me. I think you have to start with the fact that uh, how you want to play these picks. Are you gonna are you gonna hedge? Are you gonna you know? Are you gonna show and then make a decision? Are you gonna fake slide and chase back? Are you gonna switch aggressively? So I think you have to start either from hey, these are our rules and let's execute them, or give your players the ability to make decisions based on what they see. I'm, I'm more of a, I'm going to make our guys, excuse me, let our guys make decisions based on what they see. But at the high school level, I think it's probably easier to have some kind of hard and fast rules. If this happens, then you do this. If that happens, then you do that. So, you know, as far as the way I believe the teachers, I, I, I want my guy a little bit more in, on, on, in this particular dodge, I would like him a little bit more uh, parallel to the end line. You know, the guy's dodge angle is not bearing in yet. He's kind of running right now there. It means it gives you some time to maybe intersect him here if you had to. But the fact that he's squared up, right, it might be a, de- a good deterrent, but it doesn't always work. But you know, a little bit more sideways. That way I can move with him and decide to go later if I have to. Uh, that's Steve Moreland, my college teammate, Steve, at Governor's Academy. Thanks for uh, chiming in. Um, and we'll go on to the next clip. Okay, and that's a goal. All right, so we're on to the next uh, clip. Here we go. This is, oh. Hey everyone, I'm gonna make it full screen for you, make it a little easier. So I'll take that away and we're going to give you the chat on the side. We did have one more question there. Uh, in an ideal world, what would you like to hear uh, the defense communicating during that play? Uh, think it would give additional insight to the real issues. Yeah, I think uh, I need to get the, uh, I want to get the other side. The the I, I think the, you know, I, I think simplicity is key. Uh, when it comes to language. So, you know, using uh, one and two syllable words are critical. So I'm, I'm a pick left, pick right, switch or get through. Um, that's, that's the language that, uh, that we use. It's, it's simple, it's clear, and, you know, it doesn't, doesn't have too many rules uh, other than outworking your uh, your responsibility to the man who's setting that pick. So hopefully that helped. I, I talked about that on the, the previous day. I, I put a drill up and I talked about 
um, that language. So go back and check that one up on our YouTube channel. Uh, the episode was on uh, the fourth or fifth episode. Uh, so here we are, and uh, how do I play this one? Okay, just said put. So this is this is a good example of what what I call pick refusal. So a guy gets up here, they're trying to set a pick. And again, the guy's at a dangerous spot. There's a really good stance by this defender, you know, pretty good positioning by this defender who's going to have to make that switch and get through. But you could tell because he was so physical with him that they're trying to, you know, not let the pick happen and by being so physical. So they're trying to – what I was talking about the other day, they're trying to stack. And – and now, and the defender's trying to get ball pressure, but you can see right in this moment, he is now looking at the pick. Out of the corner of his right little eye, he just took a look at this pick. And, there, and, that, and this becomes, this dodge is what I call a pick refusal. And it happens a lot against teams who don't want to switch or want to mandate that you're going to get through. I don't care what happens, you're going to get through. And so what offenses start doing is, if you're going to do that, we're going to start putting these picks in more and more dangerous spots on the field. And you combine that stacking, which is this is what a stack looks like. This guy's physical with this picker, and he's looking to get under it. And by looking to get under it is when, is that Connor Fields, producer Will? Yes, it is. Connor Fields takes that and just makes a great move. So pick refusal. And so now, and again, I'm, you know, this is, this is the league. You got, you know, all this open space here. This guy two seconds ago was in your slide roll or help roll, and he's hip to hip with his guy. And obviously, I, I believe that you want to trust your defenders, but really, how many guys can own a guy for 10 seconds? I don't care whether it's this league or the, or the college level. And so this guy gets caught looking at the pick, they get caught stacking, and now he's underneath, and you're late, you know, with the cross cage slide. So you're, you know, you're a team that wanted to play a certain way. So you can see this. You can see the stack. Guy looks at the pick, and now you're looking away. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that they, you know, that because this is uh, done. Is this done? Uh, he's really good. Really good. Um, is that he's, you know, he, you know, if he goes back and watches the film, he's like, I don't really want to be face guarding my guy and turning myself away from the dodge when a guy could get in this direction, even if he could go above the pick, right? You know, either or, that's not a great play. You don't want to be looking away here. So, you know, fighting to get sideways, maybe like this guy where you can see. So this guy's got his back turned. He's got his back turned. He's got his back turned. So if you're Connor Fields, you basically, you know, you created a two-on-two -two or your defense helped you create two-on-two. -on -two. So, again, I, not everyone believes what I believe around defense, but I don't believe in looking at picks. You know, that way, you know, it makes it easier to make switch and get through decisions, and you don't get caught on this pick refusal dodge. So this is a hell of a play by, by Fields, and you can see the price of turning your back on the dodge. So, like, if I'm coaching this – this is how I'd want him to look throughout the life of that dodge. So when that ball was right here before the pick refusal, if he's like that, if he was like this, he would meet this guy on the shot. And even within that, I think he wants to get his stick out earlier so you could at least affect the quality of this shot. When you arrive with your, with your hands first, the ball is already in the back of the net. So we'll go on to the next clip here. So here's another two-man. And this is sneaky stuff that offensive guys do. And I love watching sneaky offensive stuff. So everybody watch this attackman here. Is that Will Manny? Yep. Sneaky. UMass guy. Love it. Long Island. <laughs> Went to St. Anthony's. That's not bad. It's not as good as Chaminade, but we'll leave it up there. So well, watch Manny putting his left hand out here like he's trying to set up this defenseman like it's going to be a left pick, and then it becomes a right pick. I love that. I love that stuff because I because I think uh, I think what that helps to do is you can watch this defenseman make an assumption that wow this guy's giving me a heads up and and I'm a big fan of doing this in basketball so this guy thought this dodge was going to go here 
And so why don't I just wait for him and I'll make my decision of how I have to do whatever I have to do. So by, by waiting there and thinking that, he helps create this distance, not only this distance between him and his man, but also his man and his teammate and his man and the guy carrying the ball. So that's a lot of space. And this is not outworking your man. This is making a presumption. And, and you're gonna see the price of that here in a second. So by creating that, and now it becomes, you know, it's not a pick, it's more of a, you know, a pick and roll, even though the actual pick wasn't set. So now you got this guy panicking and he, remember, he just came from like right here. Now he's flying out at a guy, but he's also flying out at a guy who is running in this direction. So I'm not sure, you know, you have to panic yet. He could have stayed sideways. He could have evaluated a little bit more. So he's fully committed with no ball pressure. If, his head, if the head of his stick is here, that's what ball pressure is. He's not there yet. And because maybe the communication wasn't great on the switch and get through, you have two people committed to the ball. And when you have two people committed to the ball and no ball pressure, bad things are gonna happen. And so we're rushing out of it. And now that same situation where this guy is a little bit further upfield of his man as Manny starts to roll, remember his momentum is taking him in this direction, his direction is taking him kind of in that direction. And if you don't get this nugget, bad things. But it, it comes back to this other thing of why defensemen guard people below GLE, which is, I'm not saying that's the mystery of the pyramids, but it's close. And, but listen, I know that there's teams that do it. They don't like to, you know, you're playing against a team that has a really good feeder or a really quick guy and you don't want him to have a long run at your defenseman. But when the ball is here, and it's a basically this two on two that they've manufactured, and you're maybe not gonna come from any of these guys, you know, call them one, two, and three. If they're gonna play three on three over here, you're the only guy, number four, who can help help. And if you're not above GLE, this is a tremendous amount of space for Will Manny to do bad things. And, you know, so whether it's preparing to help from one of these other guys, you want to see them in their side sideways stance. And um, because if you don't, it's, you're going to give up a good shot. So this guy goes for this nugget and misses it. And now you got a guy loading up and that's just, you know, so again, you're, However you were deciding to play this, I, I don't know whether the white team had a rule of how they're going to play this, but in my mind, whether you had a rule or not, this defender still below GLE as Manny takes that shot, and I can't even see his guy. So he's somewhere off the screen. And why would you worry about a guy who couldn't even make the film camera? So, all right, now we're on to the next one. All right, so we got another two man, and again, another great example of this blue team kind of splitting this side of the field and creating what we would call a two four. Two offensive players here, four offensive players over there. I wouldn't, I don't know whether they have someone who's designated in the slide roll, but this is this is advantageous for the offense. You know, ninety has the ball. I don't know if this is two Canadians, but it could be. And, you know, so they run, they give up a jab to the middle of the field. And again, another, that another fake slide. And my philosophy on fake slides and fake hedges is I always want to presume the best about my opponent, whether they've shown it on film or not. You, uh, oh, that's Shriver with the ball, a oh, Shriver rolling. Yeah. Shriver's catching this. And so, you know, I don't, you know, this guy's, the fact that I'm going to go back because I think I need to make this point a little bit better is, right? That hard left-footed plant right there is 
means to me, he is never going to get back to him. And if he's never going to get back to him, that's one thing. But if he's not, if he's going to go to him, you better get ball pressure. And if he's not going to go to him, you got to watch this left-handed plant, right? This left-footed plant right here. It's really aggressive. And maybe it makes him bounce, but he's got his hands in his eyes and, you know, this space right here to get to as these guys are all guarding their men over here. There's nobody else over here. It's a crazy amount of space for, is this Tom Schreiber you're saying? Not a guy you want to give a lot of space to. That is not a guy you want to give a lot of space to. And so either be prepared to rotate with this guy or don't do this, what number one is doing. Because, you know, again, you have the example of him being further upfield. This is now a downhill approach, and I hate downhill approaches because that's a long way. And again, you, as, a, as a high school coach, you might be saying to yourself, "Well, we don't have, we don't play a lot of teams who can throw that pass." But I guarantee you, you got two or three, two or three teams who have those guys, and you're preparing to beat your best teams, not your worst teams. And so, you basically took a two-on-two -two and made it a one-on-one, -on -one, and now he's loading up. So either switch and get ball pressure maybe earlier, or this guy, you know, if you're an adjacent sliding team, you can have this guy, we'll call him in this clip, Mr. X, excuse me, this guy right here. You know, he could be the guy who can hedge and chase back here. You know, because if you go, if you show too hard for this guy, he's not gonna get back there on that pass. And this is what's gonna happen. So you have a couple options how to play that. All right, here's another one. This is one, this one's a really good clip. This is, uh, you know, and, and there's a couple of really good offensive things here. This is, uh, this is that Sankey at X. Sankey sees that this two man is happening here and he vacates the space, which is a really nice job. So, right, you can see the two-man happen and saying from an offensive perspective, this is a really good job of him just vacating the space because by doing that, he makes it really hard for him to help. So that's a really good job by, by Sankey and, and basically taking this three-on-three -three and turning it into a two-on-two. -two. So I like that play. So you can see that. And so you can see the two-man, right? I'm not a big fan of the big lead slap. So the ball gets thrown back and they have a matchup here. All right, so you got Kavanaugh on a short stick. You know, really good, you know, I think I like the sideways presentation by these guys. Really good job by the, by the white team here, right? They got three people and you only see two green, two redwoods. So that's, that's beneficial to this team, which means if you wanted to slide to Cav right now, you'd be able to, you know, do some of that, you know, particularly if he, gets involved in this play if this guy tries to dive to the back pipe. So, but you've created this, this two on two, you know, I'm not a huge fan of squaring up. I think I said it on the earlier clip because it's so tempting and it's so easy for, uh, is this Joe Walters? I will call him, we'll call Joe Walters X here, is that by squaring up, this makes it easy for Joe Walters to decide, hey, am I gonna go here? Am I going to follow him if he goes? Really easy. And again, another example of why guard a guy who's barely in the frame. You know, Joe Sankey did a good job of vacating space, but Joe, Joe Sankey's not going to jump over the back of the goal. And so by squaring up here, this is the easiest slide in the world. So he just goes. And because he was so far away, Guard, since he was so far away guarding a guy who's now not even in the frame, he's not going to get there. It's just too far. And, and I, 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 would, I, would, I would hypothesize that it would be better if he was above the goal and could have came cross cage and had a better angle. This is, you know, this is an upfield slide, almost as bad as a downfield slide. So now Joe just follows into that space. And before he can get ball pressure, it's over. So I think, 
you know, this, the, the, whatever your rules are, you want to stay sideways as much as possible. If he could have, if he could have hedged and been a little bit more right foot here and left foot here, then he could have created that triangle that we talked about yesterday. So if he was maybe like right here, yeah, you know, with his left foot here and his right foot here, he could kill up some space, decide whether he had to go from an inside out angle and maybe still be able to chase back if he was a deterrent. But since he came right at the guy, straight up the hash, this is such an easy look. And you can see how easy it is here. And, and if I was this defender, again, with the way that I, I like to teach this, if he's, if he was, if he was here, instead of here, he'd be able to have a better angle and, and made, and made Joe Walter shoot through him, right? More than he does right there. So there's, there's Sankey coming into the screen. So I, know, I think that, I think that is it. Were there any questions that popped up? Will? Uh, no, no questions as of now. Now's a good time if you have any questions. Uh, Post them now. If not, we will move on and talk about one drill. All right. So you want to pull up, pull it up for me? Absolutely. So we're going to go to, um, I don't know, is this a private playlist or? It is. All right. So it we're, we're going we're gonna to start putting some uh, of our drills up on our, uh, up on our YouTube channel uh, here shortly. We just need to, we, we did them for our team. We just need to do them for the, for the coaches. So. So here, here's a drill. It's not a great view, but we'll we'll full screen it here, and uh, it, it's a it's a drill where we're practicing. Oh, there's my oh, man. That guy needs a haircut. Um, oh, hold on. We have one question here uh, from Anthony. Hey Jerry, from an offensive perspective, do you teach a common language for the two offensive guys to talk as well? For example, when teams are switching from a D perspective, I like the attackman to slip and create a two on one. You know, I think, yeah, I, listen, I think uh, all offenses, the really good offenses have um, rules and language about um, how they're playing certain situations. I think, but I think you're right. I think most teams will come into a, into a game and have a sense of how their opponents play two-man, whether it's at X or in the alleys. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, the late, great Dave Huntley said was really good um, attackmen are great listeners, meaning they pick up what the opponent's language is. I'm not saying that they use it against them, although it, it, they may, but they, they, can, they hear well. So sometimes, you know, the guy's setting a pick and the, the defenseman whose man uh, is setting the pick, you can almost sense how far they are away. And so you could, that can help you determine whether you have slip space or whether you're running a bee sting or, or other kinds of, of picks. So they're really good listeners. They also, as they're going to set their pick, they might look back to see how far that defenseman is away. Is he staying in a, like in the one clip from uh, where with Will Manny, that guy just stayed in, in place. So it made it easy for, for uh, Will Manny to determine whether he was going to pick or slip. Um, I think really good uh, attackmen and, and midfielders who are doing big little, they mix up their speeds. They might start with a jog or what we call a lull. Hey, I'm just jogging out to this guy. And then they speed up. They, they, they jog to a spot and then help create that separation, kind of like Will Manny did on that, that clip. So I, I, what, I'm not necessarily – I don't know whether consistently offenses have really specific language about how they – play two man, but I know they listen well, and I know they use those listening skills to punish defenses. Um, so one, more, one more question okay. before we get to the drill. Uh, coach, uh, do you prefer quick to switch when defending two man or fight hard to get through picks? Uh, also, we hear you uh, that the audio is a little choppy. Uh, we're working with uh, the Wi-Fi is not as strong as it was in our office, uh, but we are doing everything we can to make sure that you guys can hear us. Keep letting us know if you can't hear anything. 
the uh, so here's here's a simple drill that uh, we did in the in the spring. So we are you can see there's three groups going on, and we're practicing you know switch and get switch and get through decisions. Down here you can see a dodger and a carrier. You can have you have a you know a guy you know picking and popping behind the ball. And then you have some off-ball defensemen who are making, um, you know, some switch and, and slide decisions. You know, not a great example because he squared up and this guy was coming from a long distance. But you can see the price of him squaring up and now he's further upfield of his man, much like in some of those, those PLL uh, examples. So if we go to look at the middle group here, so we have a dodger, we have an on-ball guy, and we have maybe a clear through. It might become a pick. It might become a pick and pop. And then we have an interior defender. And so there's some communication going on, right? Clear and, clear and through. So we got, we got a, a switch and get through decision right here. So we're not sure if that's going to become a pick. Is it going to be a pick, pick and pop? We don't know. But you need some communication between, let me use the illustration here. You know, this guy, needs to communicate to him. And so if we're looking at, you know, one who doesn't have a man in this drill needs to communicate with two and two needs to communicate with three, who's the on ball guy. And so we're practicing, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a switch and you get ball pressure and you're off ball, you're prepared and you're trying to determine who's going to take that throw back. So it's a five-person drill, right? It's a five-person drill. I'm going to go back and show that one again because I think it's important. You start, you know, and so I have three different groups going on right now. A group here, group here, and group here. And they're all doing the exact same thing. And the, the purpose of the drill was to create some, some decision-making by number one here as his man clears through. So this guy's clearing through. And then he's going to pop behind the ball. This guy's going to dodge. Right? This guy's going to dodge. And so number one has to decide whether he's going go to go slide to that dodge or switch onto that dodge. And this guy, number two, hold on a sec. Number two, is talking to number one if, if, and if there's a slide or a switch. So you can see, right? So that guy makes a decision. And now you're seeing the original on-ball guy recover. And then this guy right here who is watching all this action can tell him to recover to him. He may take him and he recovers to the crease. I don't know what happens here. So that guy takes the man. Now the ball gets thrown back, and now he's in that role, and he's in a sideways stance. So you can practice that as, as, a, as a pick, as a slip, as a pick and pop. You can, you know, go from the, this guy. You can have this guy uh, go, and you can practice a variety of different uh, languages. Um, you know, you, you just – you know, like I was saying the other day, you want to manufacture drills that create some of the micro tensions and, and what I like to call action within action. You want to isolate them. And th these are all defensemen and D middies doing this drill where they can practice it in a low pressure environment and they can practice the language and the decision making. It's not going to be full speed and it's obviously not going to be done with the skill of of your offensive players, and it's definitely not going to be done with the skill of your opponents, but it allows them to kind of, you know, choreograph through it. It's like a, uh, it's like a uh, rehearsal of a play. Like you're rehearsing, you're rehearsing, and then when you get to the game, the lights are on, the cameras are on, and, and you're doing it full speed, and you're doing it full speed against your offensive players and, and all of that. And so uh, there was a question that came up. Your drill seems to imply that you aren't trying to help with the picker's defenseman. Is this a hard rule to do the slide and the picker's defender's job to communicate that through? We'll do that every single way where there's 
no switch. There is a switch. There's a switch and a throwback. There is, you know, the guy carries it all the way down the hash and we go from somebody else. And, um, um, you know, so you can do it a couple of different ways. And, but only if you have your perspective on playing defense is you're going to want to let your players make the decision in the game. If you're more, hey, whenever this happens, we go from the picker's defender, then, then that's all you practice. Um, another question came up. Uh, would you encourage us to teach the instant recovery at the high school level? We always encourage a quick slide. Some of the questions. I don't. I recover the slide that's needed, and I, I teach the slide that's needed based on the dodge and the space. Um, as far as recovering quickly, I think if I was coaching high school, I would slide and stay on double teams longer. I just think uh, it's hard to throw a long skip pass, and, and since there's nothing more important than ball pressure, if you can get it, keep it. Um, but that would, I, I see a lot of coaches practicing the quick recovery, and. Um, and sometimes that's the right thing, but it doesn't always work out. But if I was coaching high school tomorrow, I would slide and stay on doubles much more. Um, I think there was a previous question. I'm not sure if I got to it. Uh, but, well, we got, we got Coach Hutchinson in four minutes. That might not even be in time for another James Brown song, but we will, we will try. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, we are going to post all of our drills on the YouTube channel. And, um, and uh, you know, they're archived there on HLX 1881. And uh, we'll, we'll post that. They're going to be up probably later this evening. Please email us with, with questions uh, or post on, uh, on Twitter if you, if you want any uh, topics. We're going to cover recruiting and writing and clearing and some other special situations. But one more question before Hutch comes on. Uh, there was a question about recovery. Um, is uh, uh, question was, can you talk about recovery? I see you, I've seen you recovering to the crease, but Syracuse recovers immediately to the backside. How do you prefer to recover? You know, everybody does it differently. I'm, I, I believe in crease sliding exclusively. And, um, you know, I just think it's a longer distance. But, uh, you know, I think practicing it a variety of different ways. And we'll, we do a drill called uh, dummy five on a die that maybe we'll do that. We'll talk about recoveries in one of our next segments. So to each his own. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, and we'll see you next time. We'll probably go up again in the, uh, um, in the next uh, day or two. And uh, Coach Hutch is on in two minutes. Peace.